Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, my name is Dylan Dawson. I am part of the partner management team at Electrobit, and I'm also a Linux evangelist. Uh, for, us, for us, that means uh, sort of storytelling and finding topics around that intersection between Linux and automotive. I'm also located here in Seattle, so my commute today was pretty, pretty short. Um, so a little bit of context here about Electrobit. So we're uh, 4,000 strong. We've got uh, in 24 offices over 11 countries. We're a wholly owned subsidiary uh, by Continental, but though we strategically we act uh, and think independently. We have um, sort of a saying that we have around 600 million vehicles on the road today with our software, and that's over um, 5 billion embedded devices. So um, our competency is around automotive grade embedded software and engineering services. So it's both of those things uh, that allow us to give our customers a solution. So it's a really tough mission, uh, but something that we're really proud of. So I'm gonna to talk today about uh, that um, a proposed marriage between um, automotive, existing automotive standards, this is A-SPICE, um, and, and open source excellence. So what makes us positioned to talk about uh, qualifying software, uh, open source software inside of the automotive stack? Uh, because we've done it. Uh, rather, we've, we've helped our customers do it. And what you're looking at here is the uh, ID3. Uh, I think we don't sell these in the American market, but you guys might be familiar with the uh, ID4. And this is seen as um, really, I think, some of the most sophisticated architecture driving around today. So with this, we have uh, three VMs that have qualified uh, via Linux instances in them. And then Electabit has also offered the uh, AutoZar adaptive and classic middleware as well. So we're pretty proud of that stack. And this is all for the um, Continental uh, uh, application server, the ICAS-1 project. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, build some context here around our actual Linux offering. So we do partner with Canonical to, um, to build a mini distribution based on the Ubuntu. Um, for this, when I say mini distribution, I think a lot of you guys get that we have to trim down a lot of the uh, Linux features to fit inside of the constructs uh, of the automotive hardware and software. So uh, with this, we've cut out probably about 70% for our QM Linux, um, really keeping only the features that are important to us. And uh, we've also continued to layer on sort of uh, features and extensions that we think uh, as options, I should, I should point out. So for runtime management, uh, certainly you can use systemd, but we have, a, we have an alternative, smaller. Uh, we have, um, we have we've built other features or, or continue to integrate other open source options for um, event logging and management, containers, uh, Yocto injections, um, update APIs, things like that. So really trying to build uh, a tailored version for automotive. And so uh, in this relationship, canonical, <laughs> gosh, this is supposed to be off, apologies. Um, so yeah, canonical's job hasn't changed. So this is um, their, their job, our partners here at canonical uh, continue, continue to do the same thing, right? Which is to source um, feedback and, and um, contributions from the open source network, uh, package it, maintain it, uh, test it, uh, keep it secure. Um, but one thing they don't do is offer liability. And it's that liability that is really important to automotive, and that's what uh, today's speech is gonna be about. So I've got four sections, and hopefully by the end of this, you guys will have a little better understanding, a little clearer path to uh, community source quality assessment uh, for automotive. And for us, that means grounding it in A-SPICE principles, but still uh, maintaining and preserving open source excellence. So for the first section today, uh, I waited seven slides to show everybody the evolution of EE architecture. Sort of a, a joke here, I think we're seeing a lot of this slide, um, especially to set up SDV topics. So um, SDV, or a software-defined vehicle, this is the uncoupling of software and hardware. This is the increasing amount of software that's going into the car. Um, and so, where are we today? And I think that even um, over here in 2035, that's a little aspiration. I think maybe we might remove that and, and really just talk about um, going from flat architecture to zone computing. So um, where we are today is definitely right here. 
uh, moving uh, out of spaghetti architecture, right? Which is um, uh, 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 microcontrollers, actuators, you know, this gauntlet of wires that have uh, lead to one feature in, in one unit. Um, our OEM partners are, are very much trying to consolidate into domains, and, and that's that's really where where we are right now. Um, the the really exciting about this for thing for for, for Linux is that this brings on uh, the HPC, right? So this is uh, making something like Linux uh, possible. And so uh, we think that very much that Linux is uh, future-proof. I think that's debatable, but you know, going, uh, you know, Linux can probably support all of these architectures. So we've talked a little bit about the, the motivation. Um, definitely we see that uh, the OEMs you know, are very excited about the opportunity to use Linux. It's free, right? The price is right. But we also might think about um, how sometimes free is the most expensive. So there are maintenance concerns here, um, but they're very interested in using uh, Linux because of its established tooling and the, uh, you know, the faster development cycles. And so you know, to kind of get into that a little bit, I think it's important to look at you know, where OEMs are investing, and that's in the digital cockpit. To do that, they need to hire, you know, and they are hiring quite a few uh, you know, application developers. And what Linux will offer them is a greater pool to, 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 to do that recruiting. Um, the reason that they're, that they're doing this um, is they're getting past that sell once model, right? Here's the keys, um, here's our service department. They're building out ecosystems and looking to have subscription models and um, you know, building out rich applications that will grow brand loyalty, that will improve uh, differentiation for their platforms. And to do that, they need to hire a lot more developers and having Linux in their stack allows them to do that. Um, another thing to, uh, to kind of point out here is this idea of security through obscurity. Um, OEMs are really excited about this idea that they can go to uh, an open source community, it's all out in the open, quick responses to vulnerabilities um, you know, versus closed source. So um, a, lot of, a lot of real interest there, but we have to kind of fold in the issues in automotive that are, are, that are existing, right? So this is around liability and warranty, and you'll talk, hear me talk about this a lot today. Um, there's, a, there's high stakes here. We've got a, uh, the US has a billionaire in, in Texas who is sort of rewriting some of the, uh, the uh, safety um, cases, and, and um, we have also some, some stuff happening in, in APEC too, in, in Asia and China. Uh, but for the most part, the, the vast majority of OEMs are really focused on using a spice to make to cross that threshold, to make that choice, to take over liability and warranty, um, maintenance. You know, we, w one thing I was thinking about this morning is how many times I bought like a really beautiful Apple notebook, right? It's a nice piece of, of industrial engineering. Um, it's lasted me ten years. I've done it two or three times now. Uh, at the end of life, it seems like it could keep going, but it's that hardware that that craps out. Right? It's, it's the software that pushes the boundaries of the hardware. How do we begin to think about that for automotive as we, as we begin to look at the, the software-defined vehicle? Um, I know it's not the same thing, right? We have a, our cars are such a big part of our uh, household income. Um, Electrobit, you know, paired with our fully open source QM Linux that you're looking at earlier, uh, you know, that, that is part of our value add. We have a 15-year maintenance uh, and support package that we're uh, aligning uh, with that stack. Um, but we, get, we have to begin to really think about how much software we're putting in the cars and how that affects the end of life. Um, expectations for quality and control risk, risk handling. You know, we have, um, it's a really interesting time to be renegotiating how we assess quality in automotive. We have, uh, you know, we're increasing the features, we're increasing the amount of driving that our software is doing. Um, you know, and if I back up and think about liabil liability and warranty, that's just for the, the system itself. Um, there's, you know, if there's an event, we look at the driver, we look at the system, we decide who's at, who's at fault. The more and more that uh, we take control, the software takes control, uh, the more and more uh, we have, uh, I think, a, a changing of the guards, a, a shifting landscape. So it's now the right time to really be renegotiating how we assess quality. It, it's debatable, right? So there is a standard, and I'm, I'm a couple slides away from showing it, uh, that I really want to fold this whole thing into, which is A-SPICE. 
Um, and I don't want to move forward without talking about the elephant in the room here, which is that automotive sees the value of Linux. We understand it's high, high quality. The problem is it just wasn't made here. Uh, certainly for Electrobit and the example I'm going to show, um, it's not something that uh, we were a part of. So it's hard to fit into the ASPARS, excuse me, ASPICE model. So here it is, a first look at uh, ASPICE. So wh what do you see? C certainly the, the V model. I think I heard it, okay. Um, also a bit of waterfall. And I can talk about how uh, Electrobit in our process was able to integrate some, some Agile into this. But the important thing here is that all of the software implementation, millions of lines of code, right there, that's it. It is the process that's in focus. And that's what, you know, I just want, kind of want to establish that early here. Um, ASPICE is about process assessment. And we'll, we'll look at this again. Again, open source, you know, millions of stakeholders. Um, mastery, right? This is really, really high quality software. That's not in debate. The problem is we need to find a way to fit this into our own quality assessment. So finally getting to the problem statement. Um, I think you guys can mostly <laughs> already get what that is. Uh, and I shouldn't call it a problem statement. I should call it a, a, um, a challenge statement. But automotive OEMs have a long-standing tradition of using ASPICE to make that liability claim, to take over warranty and liability. Um, it's, wor it's working, right? Uh, there's, there is a, a, a lot of investment in doing this, and it's a lot of process. It's not uh, cheap, free, or easy. Um, the, the issue here is that it doesn't account for pre-existing software, like open source, like Linux. So what do we do? So this next section is an overview. Um, we'll go into more details in my, in my third section, but I just kind of want to lay out a couple things, starting with where do we deviate where did, where did Electrobit deviate in our assessment? Um, how do we justify those deviations? What are our compensation measures? And how can we be sure that those compensation measures are sufficient? So again, um, looking at the, at the uh, PRM, or process, process reference model uh, from ASPICE. And I'm gonna draw your attention to these 16 boxes. These are for the VDA scope. Uh, VDA is a German acronym um, I can't pronounce it, but uh, please feel free to look it up. Uh, but for our purposes today, we're really going to look at this as the boxes that are subject to assessment. And where we deviate, right? What, what are the deviations? Uh, most importantly here for SW3, software uh, design and implementation. In addition to the, the, the um, unit verification section, we're simply not doing it. It's not done. To some degree, in SW2 and the architectural design, uh, as it pertains to the interface definitions, there are some um, compromises as well, uh, uh, pertaining to the outcome of uh, 3.1. And then in uh, SW, SWE5, thinking about the uh, unit integration and verification, there are some uh, concessions there as well. So how do we justify these deviations? Uh, two arguments here. The first is that this, in fact, is not a software implementation project. This is a software integration project. It's different. As such, any detailed design documents that we have are not meaningful, unit tests not useful, um, simply it doesn't provide added value. The second uh, argument here is that there, the interfaces are, are public for Linux. Um, thinking about package dependencies, the software uh, installs correctly, right? And I think we have confidence in the alignment around the, the dependencies. Uh, the man page is another really good living document, um, something that we can refer to and it's very much public. So going back and documenting things simply isn't meaningful. So what did we do? What, 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 was, what was our approach here? Um, as a consequence, we're wanting to adapt the, the goals for specif specification and architecture. Our goal now becomes not to uh, design or implement the software. This becomes selection of software. 
uh, and that pragmatic software selection is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go into more details in, in further slides, but that becomes the, the rigor here. Um, we also want to uh, enable a layered verification. And into those two strategies that I'll, that I'll go deeper on. So here is, here's a better look at that, um, sort of at our solution and uh, the compensation measures that we've applied. Uh, as discussed, you know, we're not looking at this at a, as a software implementation project, but that of a, a integration project. For this, we were looking at architectural design records, ADRs. Uh, we've sourced this from other automotive standards, um, ISO 15288, I think to be specific. Um, but this is, is, allows us to map out and enable informed decision-making around software selection. Uh, the second thing is that layered verification, verification strategy. Um, this utilizes existing measures, right? Work already done, uh, but layers down uh, work with our partners and ourselves to show uh, successful verification. So how can we be confident that these uh, countermeasures are sufficient? Um, for this, we use, uh, and you know, there's an announcement coming uh, later on this month. You know, we're talking today about uh, quality managed Linux, but Electrobit will make an announcement uh, about Linux for safety applications uh, very, very soon. And in that uh, process, we have, uh, we've used this, the standard IEC 61508, and we've located this rigor here for, um, to, as, as a reference, and it's in the states, you know, without object, objective criteria or limited objective criteria, we can use black box testing, we can use judgment. Um, this is all sufficient for uh, a software uh, uh, integrity level one, uh, which is in alignment with, with, um, with quality managed. Um, this allows us to do black box testing, uh, go to SMEs, uh, get their opinion, document the, the dialogue that happens around software selection. So this gives us all confidence in, uh, in what we've come up with. <clears throat> so more details on the solution. Right? I've got two more slides here that kind of dives deeper in, into both of these um, compromises, or strategies, I should say. So when we look at uh, that ISO 15288, we have found uh, a defined decision model workflow. And this is what we're using. It's subject matter expert driven, uh, guided, systematic, and partial. It allows us to, and you can see a sort of a diagram there to the, to the right. Um, it allows us to, to kind of supplement uh, our decision making and uh, the flexibility to, to sort of ramp up or ramp down based on the use case of the package that we're looking at. Um, but in the end, it gives us that oversight. It gives us that, um, that the, the, the documentation that the, the right decisions have been made. Um, but we're also looking for other, other spots you know, to, to supplement this, especially in the free and open source community. So looking at licenses, are, do the licenses apply to automotive? Um, is this an active community working on this package or this code? Is the, what is the downstream maintenance uh, repercussions of this? Uh, for us, that's sort of easy because I think the first question we ask is, is this maintained and supported in the canonical uh, distribution? But we also look at the, um, the product uh, quality influence factors from this other ISO. Uh, 25010. Looking at the functional uh, suitability, what does this package do and doesn't do? Is this package too big? Is it performant? Um, will this fit in the automotive context? Is it secure? Well, how, many, uh, 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 how many vulnerabilities are, are introduced um, over, over a time period? So all those things allow us to sort of make our safety case. When we talk about the layered strategy, um, we first want to acknowledge that, that, that uh, Linux is highly, highly uh, tested and is of high quality. Uh, we also know that our partner Canonical does further tests uh, and is maintained uh, main, while it maintains Ubuntu. Um, we also ask Canonical to do further testing specific to Electrobit's use cases and maybe to our hardware. Um, once we get it ourselves, we do, um, we do some testing on our own. This is around the reference configurations. And uh, we even use other open source test suites like, uh, like LTP and, and others. We also do fuzz testing, right, for, for security purposes. So this layered uh, uh, testing approach allows us to, um, you know, sort of have, have some uh, confidence around that, that quality decision. So just to wrap things up, um, 
you know, the, I think all, all of automotive is aligned around a, a, a vision of the, the future of mobility, which is safer, cleaner, easier. And for that, we do need the help of the free and open source community. That adoption is already happening, right? Especially with Linux. Um, but it's qualifying and maintaining these free and open source libraries, which is brand new. Um, this is not a new argument. This, uh, ASPICE is not the only uh, monolith automotive standard that's being revisited. You know, I think about uh, functional safety. Um, <laughs> the, the boundaries or the, the limitations when we think about uh, automated driving and things like that, these are becoming discussions. Right? There's work, work, workarounds that are in progress. Uh, so ASPICE is not the, not the only one that needs to grow here. Uh, but if we're going to do that, we absolutely need to preserve the free and open source community, the principles, the benefits of why we're doing this. Um, and that's something that we, we, we don't want to forget. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, two more slides. Uh, this one here t is sort of an open question. So I want to, um, this is a, a framework that we, uh, we've gotten from a, a German group, uh, ZVEI. And it does a pretty good way of, um, you know, sort of compartmentalizing the readiness of, of an organization and their readiness to, to support the free and open source libraries. I think the lector bid is probably somewhere right here, uh, but we have ambitions to, to make it to level five. And we're, we're very focused on being a good citizen of the open source community. And um, so the proof of that, uh, better to show, not tell. So just an open invite um, for everybody here to, to kind of come check out our open source contributions. Uh, this is some of, some not all, but a pretty good place to start. And I think that's it. If I uh, would love to talk to you if you have questions or want to talk about your HPC project. So, thank you. Okay, I've got um, the rate of change in the Linux kernel these days at the tip is uh, nine changes an hour. The rate of backports is about one change an hour. How are you working with that in your model? Um, our strategy is, uh, you know, is not to document all of those changes. Okay. Right. Um, our strategy here is to accept that this is we are integrating pre-existing software, and that mm -hmm. we cannot document those. Now, okay. our product strategy is not to change the kernel, um, you know, every time that there's a you know, perpetually, right? right. We, uh, you know, we work with our customers to maybe freeze. We do have an, you know, our, our product, you know what I'm talking you? about. Yeah. We, we, we would freeze a, a, a Linux curl, and we would have an option to maybe update it once or twice through the vehicle's lifetime. Okay, and so are you, mon so basically you're looking at monitoring or working with Ubuntu to monitor the vulnerabilities that may be relevant and then assess, and assess putting them in or not? Vulnerability fixes specifically, not adding vulnerabilities, but adding the fixes to them. Yes, absolutely. So that that is the that is the. Um, Those are the two or three times a year ones. N no, 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 no. Oh. Uh, it, you remind me of uh, you know sort of talking with a group that was, you know, embedded automotive embedded software is just different, right? Okay. All these cars are getting connected, right? This, this, we're starting to to come around to general IT ide ideations, right? Which is pushing value all the time. Um, pushing fixes all the time. We have uh, 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 cybersecurity regulations coming in, in Europe in, in, in July this year. Stakes are getting higher. Um, no, Electrobit uh, provides not just an open source queue on the Linux stack, but the maintenance story for 15 years, and that is uh, uh. the response to CVEs, um, uh, rapid responses. Years? Right. Okay. That is not part of uh, fixing the Linux kernel. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Oops. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, with respect that, to the tailoring that you took, um, you know, for for spice, I think, I mean, um, I'm not surprised, and actually, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a wise a wise choice, you know, to to decide not to do, like the software unit, uh, you know, uh, design and software unit testing. Um, However, I'm a bit 
I mean, I'm a bit surprised about you being inspired by IC61508. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being that if you look at the work that's been done in ISO PAS 8926, it was actually going into that direction. Mm -hmm. Because what we did is basically to, um, you know, we recognized that, you know, the ISO 26262 was not fit to qualify complex pre-existing software components. And the starting point was to, um, to define criteria, mm -hmm. you know, to, to classify, you know, these uh, software components. Because at the end of the day, what is the problem, right? So what is your software unit? You say, you know, you are, we, are, we are applying a black box approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, but what is your box? What are the criteria for the definition of your box? Because sure. if the box sure. is the entire operating system, right. is that acceptable? Maybe not, right? Sure. Basically, what are the boxes? Is, you know, are the boxes like the GDPC a single box and the standard C++ library another box and the kernel another box? Right. Is that acceptable? I don't know, maybe, but for sure, maybe probably more acceptable than, you know, having the, and, you know, and this is the intent behind ISOPAS 8926. So they mm -hmm. find the classification of these boxes, mm -hmm. considering complexity criteria as well as provenance criteria. Okay. Okay. So, and so basically my, my ask is how did, you know, what are the criteria that you used for the definition of your black box? Uh, so it depends on use case, right? That, 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 that's, you know, and I'm, I'm not an expert here. I, I can certainly, um, you know, point to people who are more intimate with how we, how we crack that. Um, but I just, maybe uh, for reference. Uh, you know, we're looking at this, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this is, I, I, IEC, this is the standard you were referencing. So this is a, a, a safety standard, right? Um, this is what we've uh, used for our links for safety, uh, but in that we have uncovered uh, what we think justifies uh, a rigor that is uh, comparable to QM Linux, uh, and that's uh, uh, you know, software integrity level one, um, being able to have SMEs and have a dialogue um, this this is how we're, we're sort of reinforcing that decision. I, I don't have more details on on uh, specific you know black box testing was how much is enough, uh, but I'm happy to 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 get you in touch with somebody who who is if if that's of interest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I would be curious, but yeah, yeah, yeah happy to do it. Yeah. Hi, I, uh, I found this very interesting. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I guess I have a maybe like a high level question. As mm -hmm. somebody who's in the automotive industry, as an insider, I'd just like to mm -hmm. hear your thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. like, uh, personally mm -hmm. on this. But when I look at the automotive industry today, and I'm currently an outsider trying to figure out a way to break in. So, full mm -hmm. disclosure, I'm not any of the companies that uh, I'm about to mention. But I see the legacy auto manufacturers. Mm -hmm. really struggling to adapt to software defined vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, zone architecture, agile, mm -hmm. all the things that, you know, you would see in software engineering. But there are a few, you know, notable exceptions that are not legacy automotive. Obviously, you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in, in Asia, right, mm -hmm. we've got Kia, mm -hmm. you know, making very good inroads. And, of course, there's a number of Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. um, doing some very interesting things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I look at, you know, I think Carryad, you know, Volkswagen software issues have been, you know, well publicized, uh, Ford, GM, mm -hmm. Toyota, especially as well. Like there's a lot of legacy auto manufacturers mm -hmm. who are really struggling with this. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your thoughts on like, are, are the, the folks who are doing better with this, the, if I call them an innovators or whatever term you want to use, the folks who mm -hmm. are doing better with, uh, with this, are they using these same processes that you're describing? Mm -hmm. Are they using different processes? How are they, apparently, maybe mm -hmm. this is an incorrect uh, mm -hmm. assumption, but how are they further along on that 2035 slide, mm -hmm. right, than the, leg the, than the legacy auto manufacturers from, maybe from your perspective? 
Well, um, yeah, so I, I have an answer here. And I, I, it's, you know, I don't think we want to be disparaging towards uh, you know, the you know, legacy OEMs. But an example I often think about is that, that Model T waterfall uh, you know, fabrication line, right? Henry Ford built it, right? It's that step, 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 step. Um, and this was embedded software. If there was ever software, it was embedded. Um, and I kind of talked about it earlier. Uh, it's you push it every six months, right? Um, this is a legacy. This is baggage. Um, as these cars are getting connected, pushing value, building out ecosystems, this is new territory for automotive, uh, something that they're getting quite good at, um, either by you know, paying for it, you know, acquiring new, new skills, or um, you know, just completely redefining how they build software. It's hard to become a tech company, and the tech companies sense that. Right? So you've seen um, Google and, and Amazon, um, you know, there's others in Asia, uh, that really sense we do software really good. The automotive needs software. Let's talk. Um, so I, you know, I think your question is, who, who's, who's really leading here? Um, it is that legacy OEM that's having a difficult time in a transition period where they're no longer, you know, they're deciding where to invest. Is this around um, ADAS or, or uh, you know, this, this mission to uh, get to level four, right, that we were talking about maybe five, ten years ago? Um, to uh, do we now change our platform to have just electrical, you know, a, a brand, a, start from scratch and, and build electric vehicles? Is this where we put our budget? What do our customers want? Um, on top of that, it, it, this is overwhelming complexity around being able to build software. It's just brand new. It's just not in their DNA. And you know, Electrobit's been on uh, the ride for a lot of really fantastic companies, uh, helping them make this acquisition. Uh, you know, through, through maybe buying, you know, um, acquiring different companies that help them do this just organically, uh, learning it themselves, pair programming. It isn't. It just hasn't been an easy road, right? I think there's just uh, in opposition of you know this idea of knowledge work and, and building software is this Henry Ford uh, you know, fabrication line, right, concept, waterfall. Um, they're a little bit in opposition, but, but you know, time, is, time is their friend, right? They uh, continue to put out uh, you know, products, and they're growing their, their digital cabins, which I think is a really good, um, you know, th that's, a, that's a really smart choice, right, because that's going to bring them differentiation and um, help them find new business models. It's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I just have one other question I can ask very quickly. Mm -hmm. You said that their digital cabins, they're, you know, they're coming around to embracing Linux. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what were some of the players using before Linux? So, so you know, if we're, if we're really talking about infotainment, uh, you know, Android automotive is, is really, um, you know, Linux isn't a, isn't a perfect application there. Uh, I think it's a great companion application, especially as you know, if there, you know, when there becomes a safety option. Uh, but no, the elephant in the room is absolutely Android Automotive. You know, when it comes to infotainment stacks, um, you know, Linux, Linux, and Linux for safety um, has, you know, I think, really good applications in in, in ADAS. Uh, we're thinking, you know, that is probably the easiest place to to really build some uh, momentum uh, for Linux. But I guess time will tell. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the following of the last question, so yeah, actually we are a vendor to help legacy uh, OEMs to to obtain certain technology power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I'm seeing you the EB company is uh, doing a lot of efforts at open source world. It is quite exciting and thrilling to me. Uh, uh, another company I, I found out is uh, Apex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'm so happy. Uh, so the things are changing. Mm -hmm. So what we start from as an open source company and then to deliver while while we were delivering our solution into the vehicles. Yeah, we found out that the same situation as you said today. And uh, the AP part is fine, but while we are doing the CP part, it's inevitable for us to work with the tool chain. Yeah. One mm -hmm. of our customers is using EB Tour Trend, another one is using ETAS. Okay. So my is my question is like more more or less like like, like a proposal here. Mm -hmm. So uh, since you guys treated the uh, open source software as a black box, is that uh, possible for us to work together to add a plugin at your Tour Trend so uh, can combine <laughs> our open source software into 
the into your, your firmware while doing the code scanning and the uh, assessment during that process. So, so in that case, yeah, I believe the things gonna get a lot easier, and uh, we're gonna build a, you know uh, integrated products, and uh, you also you guys have a, a, a better ways to. Uh, observe the information and uh, mm -hmm. the good news from open source world. Yeah. Uh, for the Linux tooling, is that or are you talking yeah, about Lin the uh, Not only Linux tooling, but a lot of uh, application and open source mm -hmm. project leaves them yet. You know. Okay. So yes, like SDKs, like other uh, messaging uh, framework, like uh, like infrastructure tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk. Uh, maybe exchange uh, cards afterwards. Uh, we have a self-certification project underway. We can maybe talk about that, uh, where Electrobit is allowing are giving the tools for our partners to sort of self-certify around Linux, sort of get that stamp. Um, as far as, you know, the, probably the, the studio tools or the IDEs for our classic and adaptive Autosar stacks, those are a little bit more proprietary, but um, yeah, happy to talk about, you know, where okay, we cool. might partner, 100%. Yeah. Uh, Jason, uh, you I guess no more questions. Well, super. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks Thank everybody. You. Really appreciate it.